Want to hear something crazy? It's been over a year and a half since I bought the milling machine. It definitely doesn't feel like it, but I guess those 40 or 50 projects had to come from somewhere. So I think it would be a good time to do a teardown, replace anything that needs replacing, and then get it ready for the year ahead. But before I do that, I thought I'd give an update on how the mill is doing, and answer some of the common questions that I get about the milling machine. This is the Sieg X2.7L. It's a Chinese made milling machine from the same brand that I bought the lathe from. There are other similar sized mills out there on the market, such as the Grizzly G704 and the Precision Matthews PM25, but this is what is sold in Australia. There are other smaller sized mills out there, but I wouldn't go with anything smaller than this, and anything larger, and you'd want to go for a proper name brand machine. Well I hope the projects that I've done so far on the channel have effectively showed off the capabilities of the machine. But to sum it up, I'm pretty impressed. It's machined everything that I've thrown at it. The only times where I've really had to back off is when machining stainless and 4140. It definitely does help to use roughers as often as you can and that really speeds up machining. The only thing where this machine really struggles is machining at low speeds, especially drilling holes over 10mm in diameter in steel can really push the motor. It's only 750 watts and it's only a brushed DC motor and it just doesn't handle those low speeds all that well. This mill can come with a brushless DC motor and I think that is the better option but it wasn't in stock when I bought the mill. Thankfully I've had a much better experience with this machine than I had with the lathe. The mill hasn't had any issues at all, and the only things that I've had to fix are mostly ergonomic. I have kept a close eye on the motor control board, because these things are usually the first point of failure on these machines, and the replacement is almost 400 bucks, but so far it hasn't shown any signs of breaking. Well the short answer is yes. Obviously it will depend on your situation, but for me, this is simply the largest mill that I could have fit in my small workshop. And even getting it to the workshop from the driveway took several hours and it was quite difficult. So for me, it makes a lot of sense to use this mill. This is one of those DRO kits that you can find on eBay for about two to 300 bucks. There are no name brand and they certainly aren't cheap, but they're a lot cheaper than a proper name brand kit. On a mill like this, it does a fantastic job and it's never let me down. Now this is only a 5 micron resolution, but that's all I really need for a mill like this and the projects that I'm doing. It was definitely a good buy, though I'll probably add a third axis sometime in the future. This is a question that I've been asked about a few times recently, and I've done it for two reasons. Firstly, it makes it easier for me to film. The last thing I want is for the handle to be in shot. Though the second reason is something that I was taught in shop class on the first day of high school when we were learning about jewel presses. If you use the bottom lever, you don't have all that much travel on the quill, but also you're going to have your forearm extended right across the work area and it's possible for long bits of swarf to injure you, or the workpiece might come loose and also injure you. Definitely worst case scenarios, but these things can happen. So the rule always was to use the levers that were furthest away from you, so that you could keep your arm away from the work zone. And given the small travel of the quill, I never ended up using that bottom lever anyway, so it made sense for me to remove it. Alright, so let's get started on the job that the mill needs, and we can start with the spindle bearings. The spindle bearings definitely need to be looked at. The spindle is noticeably harder to spin than it used to be, and I can feel that it's not handling high RPM work as well as it used to. It's starting to chatter a lot more easily than it used to. I've never taken apart a mill spindle before, but I have taken apart a few jewel presses before, so this shouldn't be all that different.
And after a bit of hammering with a soft faced hammer, the spindle should come out. And the next job will be to get those bearings pulled out. And a quick trip to the auto store later, and I now have a bearing puller. Definitely not the best condition oil that I've ever seen, although that might be partly my fault. So let's do a quick run through of the spindle bearings. At the bottom we have a tapered roller bearing, which is a pretty good choice for a spindle like this. A bearing like this should be able to put up with the heavy thrust and radial loads that you get when milling. I ended up doing a fair amount of damage to the bearing as I was pulling it out, so it will need to be replaced. Interestingly though, at the top, they've instead chosen to go with a deep groove ball bearing stacked on top of a thrust bearing. I guess the idea is that the thrust bearing takes up the thrust load and the groove ball bearing takes up the radial load. It's not a setup that I was expecting and it just hasn't worked because I can feel a lot of slop and wear in the ball bearing. The question now is what to replace the setup with. I'll be replacing all of the bearings and I opted to go with some Japanese made Koyo bearings. The top bearing assembly is going to be replaced by a singular angular contact bearing and I'll leave the bottom one as a tapered roller bearing. I spoke to a few people who own the same mill as I do and this setup works just fine for them. I probably should have gone for a sealed angular contact bearing but I'll know that for next time. The next step is to put it back together and see if it's any better. Well for a second there I thought my indicator was broken. That is hardly any movement on the dial and that is pretty much as spot on as I've ever seen. I'm not sure if the spindle is any quieter but there's certainly less resistance to spinning it. I'll also make sure to keep the bearings properly lubricated and that should keep them going for a number of years. Next let's quickly fix a small issue that I have with the column way cover. The column way cover is a great addition to the lathe and it keeps all the chips and oil off the column but the bracket that it has is located at the same level as the lip on the vise and that robs you of about 2cm of travel which on several occasions has caused issues with the setup on parts. Now the solution is pretty simple and that's to move the bracket upwards. It does mean that I'll be bolting it to the bottom of the dovetails but that doesn't really matter all that much since I'll never move the head all that low. And of course to get the drill in, I had to remove the table and the saddle. I guess no job is easy as it looks. And now the bracket sticks out a little bit further than it did before, which means it needed trimming down. And with it done, you can hardly notice anything different. And with that done, I now get back that extra 20mm of travel.
Now whilst I had the table and saddle off the mill, I thought it would be a good idea to blow it up and see just how flat the surfaces are. I'll mix up my bluing solution, which is a mix of linseed oil and Prussian blue in equal parts. A few people did suggest that I try using mineral oil instead of linseed oil since it doesn't dry, but it doesn't seem to work with the oil paint that I have. It just seems to clump up and not do much. But for the quick work that I'm doing here, linseed oil will work just fine. So for anyone who hasn't seen this before, this is my small granite surface plate. It's specced to be flat to within 5 microns across the whole surface. You can get better surface plates than this, but 5 microns is more than adequate for what I need. I'll spread a thin layer of blue on the surface plate, and then I'll place the saddle on it. The saddle being the only thing that is small enough to be measured on the surface plate. Now it's going to be a bit difficult to see, but any area that touches the plate will come up as blue, and anything that doesn't will be left clear. So all of that cross-tatched area is not actually touching anything. And ideally we would want a more even contact area. So what I'll do is manually scrape this flat. What I have here is a carbide scraper and that's bolted to the end of a handle. And what I'll do is I'll manually scrape away the blue high spots. And in doing so this will remove about 5-10 to 10 microns of cast iron. The scraper that I'm using is a little bit small for this work, but it will work. So what I'll do is I'll scrape one way and get most of the blue areas, and then I'll come back in the other direction and scrape the other way, and doing it this way helps to prevent chatter. And once most of the blue is scraped away, we can put it back on the surface plate and repeat the process. And as you can probably see, this time round there is more surface area that is contacting the surface plate, and we can scrape that away. And I'll continue until I have a pattern like this. It's not the most beautiful scraping job out there, but most importantly, the bottom is flat. Or at least all of those points which are blued up are at exactly the same level. Which means we're going to have a much better fit on the table. Also, all of those low spots are going to be really helpful in trapping and retaining oil. And that's something that you won't get on a surface that's been ground flat. And of course, once one side has been scraped, the other side needs scraping too. And it's definitely not a quick method. Each side took several hours to do, but it's definitely worth it. I might make a power scraper one day, which will speed up the process quite considerably, but that's a project for another time. And whilst they're out, I'll also check the Gibbs too. It looks like someone added a scraping or flaking pattern at the factory to help retain oil, but it looks like they didn't check the flatness because only the corner and a little bit in the middle is touching. Now this is a pretty awkward shape to hold onto, so what I'll do is I'll glue it to a piece of scrap and hold that scrap in the vise. And I can always remove the bond with acetone when the time comes to removing it. Now unlike the saddle, which is made of a grey cast iron, the Gibbs seem to be made of a white cast iron. It's a lot harder, a lot more brittle, but also a lot more difficult to scrape than grey cast iron. It's a much slower process, but I think it's definitely worth the effort. And with the Gibbs now properly scraped, I can now put the mill back together. I think ideally I would have also scraped underneath the table and the dovetails because there is no guarantee that those are flat or level either, but to do that I'd need a straight edge and that's something that I simply don't have yet. The same goes for the head. 
I should have scraped it, but I simply didn't have the time to remove it and scrape it. So I think that's another project for another time. On a positive side though, with the Gibbs now contacting properly, I feel that I'm able to use much less force to take the slop out of the table. Before scraping, the screws were done up as tightly as I could go in order to take the slop out of the table, but now I'm using minimal force and it feels a lot better than it did before. And with the table now back on, I can now quickly reach around the mill so that the column is perpendicular to the table. Finally, let's talk about the flood coolant setup that I set up about a year ago. On the whole, it's been a huge success, especially when doing very heavy cuts on steel. I can push my cutters a lot further and they last substantially longer than they did before. The total setup cost was about 150 bucks, and it's definitely paid for itself in saved end mills. It doesn't get as much use as I would have liked, just because it does get very messy when I do use it, but I'm very glad that I have it on hand for those situations that really need it. For light cuts, I use the same coolant in a spray bottle, and it all filters down into the same tank and gets recycled. Personally, I like this a lot better than a mister, because misters tend to coat everything in a fine coat of coolant, plus there are risks when it comes to breathing in atomized coolant. So if I ever go for a mister coolant, or even a fog buster setup, I'll probably do that in conjunction with some sort of enclosure. Now after a year, I have lost quite a few litres of coolant. Some of that's going to be from spilling on the floor, some of it from evaporation and carry off, and some of it because I do use it on the lathe, and that doesn't get filtered back and recycled to the tank. I also haven't been that good at skimming off the whey oil off the top as I probably should have been, but thankfully there's been no bacteria or mould growth, and the coolant doesn't smell. What I'll do is I'll transfer out the old coolant into a new tub, and then I'll clean up the pump. I know a few people were sceptical as to whether a simple pond pump would hold up to this use, but it hasn't had any issues so far. Now I could have checked the coolant concentration and the pH and then refilled it with distilled water and used it, but instead I took it to be disposed and then I decided to try out a different coolant, because if there was one thing that I wasn't happy with, it was the coolant itself. Even at higher concentrations, I had quite a few issues with rusting, so instead I was switching over to a semi-synthetic that I've heard good things about. The final thing that I did was raise the coolant lip at the front of the vise. The lip wasn't that tall from the factory, and every now and then I did have coolant spilling over which made a pretty big mess. The fix was pretty simple. I first scraped the paint off to reveal the cast iron. I then used some metal putty to build up the edge. I'll then paint over it with some enamel paint to protect it.
And whilst I was at it, I also gave the whole vice a quick coat of paint. I never much liked that old blue. It had a hint of green, and that was pretty difficult to colour correct. Personally, I think this new marine blue look looks a lot nicer. Well, it's definitely nicer to use the mill now. Definitely less chatter and a much nicer surface finish. The new coolant is great too, but unlike the old stuff, it doesn't rust the mill, which is a huge plus. That new raised lip is also working really well. Overall, I'm really happy with the mill and it should be ready to go for this year's projects. And that's about it for now. I hope you enjoyed these upgrades. Thank you very much for watching. See you next time.